What's up, everybody? It's Chef Bay, and you're listening to the Plant Room Me podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to be on the mic, and I'm so grateful that you decided to hit play and spend some time with me today. This is going to be an amazing episode. It's a big episode. I have some news to share with you, and I hope you're excited just like I am for the news. If you're new here, uh, my name is Chef Bay, also known as Bay Ruskus. I am a professional plant-based chef as well as an animal welfare activist, but I'm also just obsessed with food, obsessed with whining and dining and doing good things for my palate and also the environment at the same time, and that's what this podcast is all about about. So I really appreciate you being here with me and let's get into it. So I have some news first and foremost, before we get into the episode, this is going to be the last episode of the plant remedy podcast. As you know, it, I've taken a lot of time to really think about and reflect over the 90 ish episodes that we've done over the years. I've made such incredible relationships with all of our guests. I have built such an incredible relationship with myself through this podcast, and I've connected with so many of you guys. Now, this doesn't mean that the podcast is actually going away. We're just doing a little bit of a rebrand and we are kind of broadening our horizons is as far as the podcast goes. And we're going to be kind of talking about so many other different things. I feel like we've talked so much about plant-based living. We've talked so much about veganism, so much about the environment. And while we will still be talking about those things, I really want to talk about other things, talk about things that I'm interested in, talk about social media and business and sustainability and all the things, like all the things that encompass who I am, why I'm here and all the things that I'm passionate about. And so we are going to rebrand and call it the Chef Bay podcast. And the other thing about it is they're going to be snackable episodes. So they're going to be 15 to 20 minutes long so that it's a really digestible episode for you to listen to on your way to work and just get that information that you want to get, feel inspired and move along with your day. So that's our big news. We're really excited. I hope you guys are excited too. I'm going to be dropping some cover art options on Instagram in the next couple weeks. So look out for that because I'm going to need your vote as to what we're going to change the cover art to. And I really want to know what your favorite ones are because I'm so excited about the cover art that we have. So yes, that's my big news. So excited. Today we have an amazing guest, James Wilkes, on the show. He is the creator of the Game Changers movie. If you haven't watched that movie, maybe you should just pause this podcast and go watch it really quick. But it was a movie, is a movie that has revolutionized the way that we look at plant-based living in regards to nutrition, fitness, athleticism, and men. I think there's such a stigma around like men having to eat meat. And James Wilkes just does such a great job at kind of like ending that stigma. He's also a professional UFC fighter. And I actually used to do Muay Thai when I was younger and I was obsessed with UFC. So I've known about James Wilkes for a really long time. And it's really cool to see our worlds kind of like blending together and being able to meet on the podcast and talk together talk to each other on the show. And it's just such a good episode. We talk a lot about the stigma of nutrition. We talk a ton about plant protein, He has some amazing tips. I mean, personally, I'm really trying to get into the best shape of my life right now. I want to be incredibly strong. And so I was asking him for some tips on how to get into the best shape of your life on a plant-based diet. So we talk about that. There's just so many good, amazing nuggets of information. And of course, we talk about his groundbreaking documentary, The Game Changers, and what he's up to for Game Changers too. So there's so much good information in this podcast. You're definitely going to want to listen to it. You're going to want to maybe take notes, share with a friend. I know that my dad watching the Game Changers documentary was really one of the reasons why he decided to eat so much less meat. And it's just been such a tool for me to kind of like show people that, hey, you can be really fit. You can be healthy when it comes to like being strong and being fit while also taking care of your heart health and your gut health and planetary health as well. So it's kind of like a win, 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 win. And I'm just really grateful for James Wilkes to sit down and have this conversation with me because I think it's super necessary. And I think it is the best possible way that we could go out on such a high note with the Plant Remedy podcast. And I'm just feeling all the feelings right now. I'm so grateful. So yeah, so before we get into the episode, I just want to talk about two things really quick. The first is we are in the middle of our raw reset challenge. 
over in our community. And it's essentially a Raw Till 3 reset. There's shopping lists, there's a full seven day meal plan, and there's an ebook that's included. We have hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world taking the challenge with us right now. And we're running the challenge one more time in September and that's it. And it's not going to be available until next summer. So if you're looking for a reset, looking to deep low, looking to just incorporate some more raw, low oil recipes into your diet, this is such a good place to go, especially if you're feeling like you're in a food slump. I know I get there sometimes, which is actually why I designed this challenge for myself. And so I highly recommend you check it out. If you want to check it out, go to www.chefbay.kitchen forward slash raw reset. Again, that's www.chefbay.kitchen forward slash raw reset. And of course, as always, we'll put all the information in the show notes so you can kind of like check it out and click the link there. And secondly, I just want a huge thank you to our sponsor, Light Life Foods. Are you looking to add more plant-based protein into your diet? Well, look no further. You've got to check out Light Life Foods. With no cholesterol or saturated fats, these delicious plant-based proteins power you up and never weigh you down. Whether you're a vegan, a vegetarian, or just simply looking to increase your plant-based protein, which is what we're talking about this entire episode, Light Life Foods has you covered. Their plant-based smart dog, smart bacon, and smart ground are packed with the flavor you crave without leaving you feeling sluggish. With Light Life Foods, you don't have to sacrifice taste or texture. Their innovative recipes and high quality ingredients ensure that every single bite is as delicious as it is nourishing. So why wait? Find Light Life Foods in the produce aisle at your grocery store near you and visit their website at www.lightlifefoods.com for recipes, tips, and more. All right, y'all. Let's get into it and welcome James Wilkes to the Plant Remedy Podcast. All right, everyone. I'm sitting here with the amazing James Wilkes. What's up? Welcome to the show. No, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. How are you? What's going on? Good. Yeah, it's been super busy. Um, you know, trying to stay in shape, uh, looking after my kids. Um, we've got Game Changers 2 that we're working on. And then we're also launching a Game Changers inspired brand. So it's a lot all together. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. How do you manage all of that, especially having kids? Um, I don't know. You just got to fit it all in, right? So I yeah. um, got to try and stay in shape. So I try and hit the workout early in the morning. So I've got that out of the way. And um yeah, the kids is a lot, especially over the summer, right? Mm. There's a lot of driving and uh, going around, you know, seeing friends and that type of thing. But just trying to fit it all in. But yeah, it feels like from early morning till you know late in the evening, there's always something going on and um, just doing the work um, whenever I can. You know? Yeah, totally. I don't have kids, and I'm always amazed at people who you know run their own businesses and manage to have kids because I'm at the age where I'm like, are we going to do this? Are we not going to do this? So I'm always curious to see how people make it all work. Yeah. I think there's always time to fit stuff in that you think there wouldn't be, you know, Yeah. whether it's like you were just um, scrolling on social or watching some TV or like, there's lots of pockets of time that all add up. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, especially working out, people are like, oh, I don't have time to work out. I'm like, really? I mean, the, you know, the st other stuff you see them doing when they post on social, like going out drinking and partying or, you know, talking about TV shows or like, there's always time to work out. And even you don't need that much time. Right. Mm -hmm. You can you can even do like, you know, they call them exercise snacks. Like if you're sitting at the computer, get over and do something for one minute and do that 10 times in a day. You know, and, and even like if you go to the gym or go to the park and work out or go for a run, you really don't need to um, put hours of workout in to, to get significant benefits. In fact, really, the benefit, the major benefits, you know, there's a big ramp up from doing no exercise to doing a little bit like there's a major curve there of benefit. And then the yeah. more and more you do it sort of starts to flatten out a little bit. So. Some of my, this morning, my workout was only 20 minutes, maybe, you know, it was pretty intense, but it was short. And so sometimes I can get, you know, 45 minutes or an hour in a workout. And then sometimes it's just too busy um, yeah. we had this call and had some other calls before this. And so just trying to get, uh, some, get those quick workouts in sometimes. Squeeze it in when you can. I know there was a time where I was doing like squats when I would be brushing my teeth because I would just be like so busy, you know, especially as a chef, I would be like, okay, I need to like get something in other than standing. So yeah, I like that workout snacks. That's a good yeah, term. And then also I find ways of integrating it with the kids. Like the kids like going hiking now mm. and then obviously got to walk the dog. So take the dogs on a hike with the kids. And now you've just sort of done three things in one. You're getting, <laughs> yes. workouts, you know, you're getting out in nature, which is great. And yeah. Then doing something with the kids and, um, you know. Getting the, the dogs tired. I love it's that. It's just like the same with their martial arts training that they're doing. It's like they don't always want to go 
and they're like, ah, eh, no, you know, if they're sitting around um, yeah. playing a video game or something, they yeah. don't always to go. But once they're there, they really enjoyed it and glad that they did it. So same with hiking and martial arts for the kids. It's like, just get them, you know, you got to push them a little bit, right? And then once they do it, they enjoy it. Yeah, it's so funny that you say that because like this is such a full circle moment for me. So I used to do martial arts when I was in high school. So I did competitive Muay Thai. I was obsessed with um, UFC, obsessed with Ultimate Fighter. So it's so funny that we're talking now. I feel like it's like my old life and my new life kind of like blended into one. So it's definitely like a full circle moment. Do you feel like it? Do you feel like it's kind of interesting being in the plant based world and also that world? Do you feel like like what has the integration been like between those two worlds? Yeah, I mean, I think early on when I went plant-based, people were sort of looking at me like, why would you, you know, especially in the martial arts community, like, why, why would you be doing that? But yeah, saw that my endurance improved and my strength improved and my, my recovery got quicker. Um, it was interesting in Orange County, there's quite a lot of sort of uh, MMA guys and jiu-jitsu guys that started shifting towards either mostly plant-based or completely plant-based. So oh, I wow. think, yeah, I think it's really, uh, there's a lot of jiu-jitsu guys now, especially um doing the more plant forward eating. So I think it's really taken off. And, and I think that's quite an integration there now. So yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like because yeah, because outside looking in, you wouldn't think it's like a super plant friendly industry, you know, it's like a little intense. <laughs> right. But... You, know, you look at back at a lot of the martial arts history, like some of the, the Shaolin monks were originally completely vegan. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. And then even the Gracies, the Gracie family that started the UFC, and are considered the sort of the elite family and, and really sort of started Gracie and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm. Um, their diet was very much plant based originally as well. So if you go a bit further back, yeah. um, there was a lot of plant based influence, probably got lost for a while, but I feel like it's coming back now. Yeah, totally. And I think there's also kind of like that self respect and the respect for other people that you get from martial arts. That's something that as a teenager that taught me so much about just like myself and the world and interacting with other people. And I think when you think about it that way, incorporating a plant-based lifestyle or eating plants or eating with more compassion is kind of like right on par with, you know, the basis of what martial arts is and not necessarily like the commercialization of what people see UFC as. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So I ask every guest this in the beginning, but like, what's your favorite plant-based meal right now? As a chef, I just have to know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Honestly, and this sounds this sounds odd because it sounds basic, but the oatmeal that I make, and I don't really like oatmeal just by itself, but mm. I make cherry chocolate oatmeal. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's got oats and lupin in there. I put frozen cherries, peanut butter, rum, butter, uh, banana, some flaxseed, yeah. and then I'll throw nice. in some protein uh, powder sometimes. But yeah, cherry chocolate oatmeal, and I have that nearly every day. And sometimes, you know, often for breakfast, but sometimes uh, I'll even do it later in the day as well. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the breakfast afternoon vibe is really good when you're really busy. I'm actually drinking something super similar to that right now, Oh, interesting. which is so funny, yeah. but I'm drinking the protein. Love to talk to you about it. I love it. It's super fluffy. It kind of reminds me of a frosty. So mm. tell me about like the phytoprotein. Yeah. So, I mean, we kept getting so many requests for um, products that were convenient and delicious that met the the team behind the Game Changers sort of standards for yeah. health and performance and a sustainability factor. And obviously there's lots of foods out there can, that can help you with your goals for health and um, performance. But in terms of convenient, delicious products, you know, that are ready to go, um, yeah. that high protein, I just really couldn't find things out there that I liked. And even my kids, you know, I've made smoothies for them and they're like, oh, there's got, pr- you know, I can tell there's protein in this. Like they can just know right away with the texture. Yeah. And there haven't been a single protein that they liked until the one that we developed. Um, and so people kept asking us uh, for those I mean, like, because I couldn't really find things that I wanted to recommend. And so we thought, okay, we're just going to have to to build it. So, which is why we um, formed Phyta, F-Y-T-A, which derived mm-hmm. from the Greek word for plants, but in British English sounds exactly the same as Phyta mm-hmm. uh, in American, slightly different, but um, we just felt like we needed to form that company in order to offer those products to people to make it just more convenient uh, to get get the protein in. And so uh, the first product was our Elite Plant Protein, um, which is made with upcycled barley, the world's most sustainable protein, and uh, whole ground lupin, so whole food in a soil regenerating crop. And um, yeah, people seem to be loving it. We only launched like um, just a while ago, and people are posting organically about it, just loving it. And yeah, in various foods, and you can use it like regular plant-based protein, but also put it in um, other places that protein can't usually go. So coffee, yoga, oatmeal, baked goods, where usually if you put plant protein in, it ruins the texture. 
Yeah. But, uh, even in my coffee this morning, I got uh, you know, 30 grams of protein. I've even tried putting 45 grams. And it just disappears. So it's, it's just great. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. I put it in my coffee the other day too, just to see what the hype was about. And it was, it, I was like, what's happening here? Because it froths like, you know, you had mm. put milk in a frother or something like that. Yeah. I, I love it. So what was like the the testing like for the protein? Like what were the main things that you were looking for? And why did you choose the protein that you chose versus kind of the typical proteins that are in every other protein powder? Yeah, we looked at all the different proteins uh, that were out there, and then we came across this uh, upcycled barley protein. Mm -hmm. So it's actually uh, the saved grain from the beer brewing process. So, you know, when you make beer, you only pull the starch out. So you're left with right. the protein and fiber that's bound together that was being thrown away um, or fed as, as animal feed. And they figured out how to separate that, creating, you know, per life cycle analysis, the world's most sustainable protein. So less water use, less land use, less pesticide use, less emissions than any other protein on the planet. And it's also the most soluble uh, plant protein. Um, and so those are like side benefits to me because we we're really looking for something something that had um, uh, the right health uh, aspects to it. And so, you know, for example, our protein blend that we've developed um, not only exceeds the thresholds for leucine, which is a particular amino acid that helps drive muscle protein synthesis and also essential amino acids. So beyond the threshold for those, but it has 20% more glutamine than whey protein even, which has been shown to help with muscle recovery. So we were looking at that intersection of performance and health. So mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that our products always had 10% or less of calories coming from saturated fat, right? Because a lot of them out there have too much saturated fat or too much added sugar. Um, and so we just had a certain you know criteria that we wanted to meet. And these proteins allowed us to do that. Um, and we wanted to get that whole food in there, which is very rare in protein powders. So we've got yeah. whole ground lupin and ancient bean, which is naturally very high in protein. Um, I also use lupin like in my oatmeal sometimes or in various dishes because people, you know, people haven't heard of it, but it's higher, the highest uh, protein bean, higher than soy even. Like naturally like 45% of the calories are going wow. to around that. So, um, and from that whole food, you get the fiber, the antioxidants, the polyphenols, which right. have got both benefits for health and potentially performance. So um, yeah, really looking at that intersection of health and performance and then finding something that's sustainable. And those two ingredients really formed that really unique proprietary blend. So I was super excited about that. I love that. I think it's so interesting too, when you talk about like the differences between whey, because I feel like whey is so hard on your digestive system. It's so hard on your gut. I remember when I was training, when I was fighting, I would drink whey protein all the time because that's what everyone would tell me to drink. And I just remember my gut just being so jacked up all the time. So it's nice to kind of have like, you know, I think that's the beauty of being in the plant-based space and being in the fitness space, because you're able to think of performance, like, and your gut health, you're able to think of, you know, building muscle and your skin or, and your food allergies. Mm -hmm, like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like one or the other. Yeah. I mean, some people can tolerate way okay in terms of digestion, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people, well, a lot of people are lactose intolerant, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and like the majority of people basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then a lot of people have digestive issues with whey. So we really wanted to offer a good alternative. Um, and I think that our product's the first one that really competes with whey on a texture basis. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And so we tested it at the National Food Lab for taste and texture and consumer testing. We beat the top two leading plant based brands three to one. So we were really happy about that. So I think we've really offered something that's, you know, competitive with whey protein cool. in terms of texture. So yeah. Yeah, about that. that's awesome. So if people want to get it, where can they get it? Are you going to be offering it in stores or like, what's the next game plan for the protein? Uh, it's Yeah, it's only available on the website, which is okay. fyta.com, F-Y-T-A.com. Um, and, you know, for the foreseeable future, that's the only way we're offering it. But okay, down cool. the, at Amazon and stores and stuff like that. But, okay, cool. Yeah, so we've been super busy with that. And then also we're working on Game Changers too, uh, totally independent of that. So pretty excited about that as well so exciting so like how is game changers 2 going to be different from the first one i know the first one made such an impact for so many people i know it helps make my dad go more plant-based which you know never would have thought my new yorker dad would ever do that but there are so many little things that you added into that movie that i think was so kind of like targeted towards men specifically so yeah how is the second one going to be different yeah, well, you touched on the impact of the first one. So um, it appears conservative estimates to be by far the most viewed documentary of all time. We had over mm. 200 million views. 
estimated including 1.5 billion media impressions and 40,000 organic press articles written about it. Wow. The interest in plant-based eating more than tripled worldwide within a few weeks of the film's release, according to metrics on Google Trends. So it really did have a massive impact, and especially with men, as you said, because you know we talked with there was that um, erection scene, which was really like a uh, pretty strong. Yeah. There was a lot of men in the film, um, and really, you know, there was a lot of. Um, sort of stigma against vegan eating, especially amongst men in general or mm -hmm. traditional, sort of that traditional male. Um, and so I think there really has been a big shift um, towards more men eating plant-based diets, which is great. Um, but the second film, a lot of people have been emailing us that are athletes saying, hey, can you want to cover my story in Game Changers 2? But Game Changers 2 isn't going to be a repeat of Game Changers 1, mm -hmm. right? We're not going to just sort of talk about all these athletes and how they're doing because we've sort of done that story. Um, so there will be some sports and athletics theme to it, um, but we're really going to touch on more interpersonal issues. Uh, issues. So where the first film touched on more of the personal issues like health and performance, and we touched a bit on the environment. The second film, uh, we're in pre-production right now, so we don't know exactly what it's going to contain, but you know more on kids' health, um, food justice, right, access to food both here in the United States and internationally um and uh, you know more on sustainability i mean if you look at the the planetary impact of animal foods right like 75 percent of the um, agricultural land is for animal um agriculture yeah. and yields yeah. only 18 percent of the calories beef alone is responsible for 60 percent of all land um and yields only two percent of the calories and only five percent of the protein so the human food system is the largest global pressure on earth and there's a big disproportionate shift or um, you know, impact from animal agriculture. And we need to shift back to more plant-based eating, which will free up land, right? Yeah. It's just inherently inefficient, right? Like 33 calories into a cow to get one calorie out, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so we're using so much land. And what we really, the biggest thing that any person can do is shift towards more plant-forward eating. And then that land will be freed up and can be rewilded. And that reeled up wilded land will draw down carbon. And that's really the biggest way that we can draw down the carbon <clears throat> and reduce methane emissions um, from, you know, from the cows and, and other animals. So, yeah, I think from a sustainability perspective, um, it's, it's just a necessity that we have to shift, um, mm -hmm. you know, the more in that direction. Yeah, it's so important, too, because like there's so much talk online, especially about like regenerative agriculture and like all the carnivore loving people that's like their thing they have just like held on to that so hard so it, i'm excited to see how you guys like if you do talk about that in the film because that's a lot of bs that's going on right now yeah i think there's you know the, well there's this sort of overall term regenerative agriculture and it's been a little bit taken over by the holistic grazing movement mm -hmm. so there are some benefits to regenerative agriculture right. in the space um but it's sort of become synonymous to holistic grazing with regenerative agriculture and so we have to sort of that's a holistic grazing is a subsection of that regenerative agriculture and that holistic grazing, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to use that as a solution, right? Like, and I think in some cases they generally feel like it's a, uh, an option. Uh, in reality, it's not the papers that have been written about it have not been written in the peer reviewed journals and replicated. Right. And if you look at um, land use, Harvard and Boston university did uh, a study in 2018 showing that if the US switched from, even just from conventional to grass fed, mm. we would need anywhere between 63 to 279% more land, depending on the part of the country. And regenerative uh, holistic grazing would require twice that. We like simply don't have enough land uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And senior science writer, Emily Cassidy, um, said that if we grew food for just human consumption, after she looked at all the data, it would increase food production by 70% worldwide. And we could feed an additional 4 billion people. So we are literally, in some cases, taking grains from countries in which people are starving to death, literally, and then feeding our cattle for an inefficient production of calories, right? So that mm -hmm. we can eat beef or chicken or pork or whatever. Um, and so that would that, that 4 billion people additional we could see would exceed the 2 to 3 billion expected in projected growth by 2050. And so we're, we're not even currently feeding the population that we have, let alone a growing population. And the only way to do that is to get away from animal agriculture. Um, it's yeah. as simple as that. And not to mention like what, 40% of all of that gets thrown in the garbage anyway. We're using yeah, of most of our clean water to feed agriculture. 
So, and to like grow these grains that are then being fed to agriculture. Then you look at like all the pharmaceuticals that are going into these, this cattle. It's like, this problem is so ginormous and it's oh, yeah. taking up so many resources. It's, it's really intense. Yeah. Animal agriculture, like you said, number one use of fresh water, number mm -hmm. one uh, issue with water pollution. Um, number one reason for lack of bio, a loss of biodiversity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And antibiotics, particularly. I mean, there's a lot of experts that feel that that's going to be the next pandemic is antibiotic resistance, because most of the antibiotics are fed to animals. We then, you know, the general population eats those animals, and then they're becoming, the humans that eat those are becoming antibiotic resistant. And so we're creating more antibiotics all the time, but it's going to become an issue at some point, they feel. Um, and then, of course, three out of four um, pandemics have been of zoonotic origin, of animal origin, either wild or, um, in most cases, animal agriculture. Yeah. Or, or, a, or a shift from or a transition from wild into uh, animal agriculture and so yeah it's it's, it's multifaceted the issues right and it's such a the one thing that we can do we do it three four or five times a day is eat right mm -hmm. um, or i do anyway <laughs> five times a day yeah <laughs> but, um, the number one thing that we can do is shift towards more plant forward eating and you know solve uh, or help solve so many of those issues yeah. I mean, it can get like super, I get down sometimes. I feel like, you know, we're both doing things to really help the movement. Do you feel like we have to wait for like a, this wave of polit this older politicians group to kind of like fade out until real change happens? Or how do you see it really happening on like a big scale when it comes to changing the food system? Well, I don't, I don't think we can rely only on the politicians, right? I think that we have each yeah. individual has a massive amount of power, yeah. right? And like every time you buy food, you're basically voting with that dollar. Yeah. And so, yeah, I do think that we need, you know, there's lots of ways of addressing this, right? And um, political lobbying is one of them, right? And changing mm -hmm. the, the laws and the politics. But I think the bigger shift is going to come from individuals feeling yeah. empowered to make their own decisions. And so, what we're trying to do, you know, with our Game Changers Institute, which is our nonprofit research education advocacy platform that's promoting plant forward eating. And again, when I say plant forward, we're not trying to say you've got to be vegan or you've got to be vegetarian. But the science really shows that just shifting to a more plant food diet, you know, especially whole plant foods, is going to be beneficial in all of those areas. Um, but that's yeah. what we're trying to, to trying to say there is like give the information uh, and the education, and then people can make their own decisions. I'm not trying to tell anyone what they should be eating but just providing information and then people making their own decisions about, you know, how far they want to lean into that plant forward eating. Um, yeah. 100%. I mean, we don't need a few perfect vegans. We need like millions and millions of people doing it imperfectly no. in order to change things. So speaking of protein, I'd love to hear like the biggest myths around protein, creatine and collagen. I feel like you're the perfect person to ask. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the biggest myth, obviously, well, I think before the game changers, there was this general notion online that um, plants didn't have any protein in them, mm -hmm. right? That's the first, like, oh, you or you couldn't get enough protein. And now I feel like since the game changers came out, people are like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, there's protein in plants, right? Because as we know, protein doesn't originate in animals. Animals are just the middlemen. They get that protein and essential amino acids from uh, from the plants that they eat, right? So you can cut out the middlemen and go straight to the source. And there's many benefits to doing that. But I think the conversation shifted after the game changers came out saying, okay, well, yeah, there's protein in plants, but you've got to be more cognizant about it. And then they'll say, well, you can't get enough protein. They say, okay, well, you can get enough protein. But, you know, if you're in this situation where you're in a big caloric deficit and you're a bodybuilder and you've got this competition coming up and you need to drop weight rapidly while still maintaining your muscle mass. So now they've gone from like this tiny part of the population, which is bodybuilders, to like, the tiny part of the population of the body was that are currently prepping for a competition. Yeah. And they say, no, and you can't do that well, unless you have protein powder. Okay, well, but the om omnivorous people are all having protein powder too. Like over 50% of um, uh, athletes uh, at the amateur level are eating protein powder and at professional level, over 80% are having it anyway. And like how simple a switch is that to go from like whey protein to some other sort of protein if you did want to do protein powders? No, right. for the vast majority of people, you don't need to do protein powders. It can often make it, you know, convenient and easier and a tasty way to get it in. But they've sort of really changed the conversation from like you can't be vegan and be athletic to now like, okay, you can, but there's certain scenarios where it's harder. Um, I mean, the, the reality is you do have to be more cognizant, right? So 
I think there's a lot of vegans that don't want to say or think that protein's an issue at all. And so they'll say, yeah, yeah protein doesn't matter. That's not true, especially for people that are active um, and athletic. It's not true for uh, like a lot of women in the US, even that are meat eaters aren't getting as much protein. Um, it's not true for older people. Like once you're over 40, 45, your protein requirements go up. When you're a child, you've got higher protein requirements. So you do have to be cognizant about it. And so what you can't do is whatever you're eating, let's say you're eating a steak and potatoes and veg, you can't mm -hmm. just take the steak off of the plate. Right. Like you've got to replace that with some of the higher protein sources. So legumes, right? Beans, peas, lentils are great um, sources of protein. And even in the vegan community, we see some people saying, oh, beans aren't a good source of protein because they're not over 50% protein. But your diet doesn't need to be over 50% protein anyway. And mm -hmm. when we look at what good protein is, there's these really faulty protein scoring systems. So there's PDCAS and DS, these protein scoring systems, which were never designed for people in the Western world that have access to grocery stores. They were developed by the WHO and the FAO for starving children uh, in countries where they didn't have good access to food. They were never designed to look at the downstream physiological effects of people that have access to plenty of calories and or for active people. But somehow people have taken these protein scoring systems and said, well, if you want to build muscle, let's look at this PDCAS or DS. They were never designed for that. Right. Um, and when you look at what is a good protein, to me, mostly you eat food, right? You don't just eat protein and just eat carbs and just eat fat. And when you eat food, protein comes in a package. And so if you're looking at what is good quality protein, do you want that protein with fiber, with antioxidants, with polyphenols and all of the benefits, right? Or do you want it with saturated fat and cholesterol, advanced glycation end products, all of these things that can come um, higher levels of toxins and toxicants and persistent organic pollutants that bioaccumulate, you know, which package do you want that protein in? So number one, you can get enough protein. You do have to be a bit more cognizant and think about getting higher protein foods in. Two, the quality issue. That's another thing. Oh, you don't get enough quality, people will say, protein. Well, even since the film came out, they've shown that if you're getting enough protein, for even trying to maximize muscle mass, right, which the mm -hmm. number seems to be around 1.5 or 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, even at that, it doesn't matter if you're getting that from plants exclusively or from animal products, uh, a mixture of animal products and plants. You still build just as much um protein so i think that's the biggest thing with protein is you can get enough protein and this sort of protein quality scoring systems don't uh, apply to people that can you know get enough calories and get a wide variety of foods and live in a developed country where they can eat um, plenty of food yeah uh, and then the second thing you asked about was creatine mm -hmm. so with the game Changers institute um, i think you can go to our website gamechangersinstitute.com or maybe we could put the link in your show notes yeah i will um, but we, the Game Changers Institute, uh, with David Goldman, our chief science advisor, um, did put out a paper on creatine and showing the differences between getting creatine from uh, meat versus getting creatine from a supplement. And mm. so your body makes about a gram of creatine a day. And for most people, that's fine. If you are trying to maximize muscle mass or maximize your performance, taking supplemental creatine is probably a good idea. There may also be some cognitive benefits. Uh, to supplement with creatine but it's very clear in the literature that it's better to get it from supplements than it is to get it from meat and that may be because some of the other things in meat may offset the benefits yeah right? like maybe the saturated fat or, or something else in the meat so we can put that link uh, on the paper to creatine we can also yeah. put a link if you like to a paper that we published in the peer-reviewed literature on the protein scoring systems and why they don't apply um for you know muscle building especially on plant-based diets yeah, I think that's, I feel like the protein scoring systems too, kind of diet culture has kind of used it to its advantage when it comes to like the sphere of carbohydrates, because that's very much a thing, especially when it comes to diet culture and people trying to lose weight and all that kind of stuff too. And people are definitely afraid of the fact that like, you know, plant-based protein comes paired with carbohydrate and comes paired with fiber, but right. really it's like such a positive thing. It's not a yeah totally. negative. Like, there's, this, there's a misunderstanding uh, on carbohydrates where you know uh, refined sugar and white flour and things do add typically to weight gain mm -hmm. mainly because you end up eating more calories that's the primary reason that's happening because the caloric density is high right so you yeah. have stretch receptors in your stomach and so if you're isolating sugar you can eat lots of it right before you, you feel full so that's a primary mechanism um 
of why those ref highly refined carbohydrates like that um, can cause weight gain. But carbohydrates in general, uh, especially coming from uh, whole plant foods, actually are um, correlated with less body fat percentage, uh, slimmer waistline, and, and so forth. So people don't need to be worried about carbohydrates uh, if they're getting it from whole plant sources. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love me some carbs. I literally live and die on carbs. I love them. Okay. So I wanted to ask you because I, most, our audience is primarily women mm. and I feel like I'm getting probably like 20 to 50 messages a day about like getting in shape, losing weight, like all that kind of stuff. So I thought you'd be the perfect person to ask, like, what are your top five tips when it comes to getting into the best shape of your life on a plant forward diet. And I say this because there's so much misinformation online, or let's say somebody wants to get in shape. They go to their gym and they hire just a random trainer and the random trainer hears that they're plant-based and they're like, no, no, no. Like you're never going to be able to get what you want on a plant-based diet. And so I think I just wanted to kind of like clear the air and just hear your perspective on getting in shape because it's summer. And I think that's what everyone's thinking about right now. Yeah, I mean, I think we first got to think that nutrition plays a bigger role than exercise does mm -hmm. on, on body fat, especially. Um, and so the first thing is that you're eating uh, a very plant predominant diet, whether that's going exclusively plants or not. And yeah. those plants should largely be whole plants. So that's a range of legumes, right? Beans, peas, lentils that we talked about, nuts and seeds, fruits and vegetables, um, and that type of thing. So that's the, I think the number one thing is, is getting a lot of whole plant foods in your diet and a wide variety. Uh, and like you said, we're going to hit those stretch receptors in your stomach sooner. So you're going to be full. So that's, that's number one is that nutrition is key and plant predominant diet is key. Second thing is there really doesn't seem to be um, for, for health. You know, there's all these people that are saying, well, you should eat six small meals a day. And there's some people who should eat only one meal a day and fast all day. In terms of fat loss, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. And in terms of health, it doesn't actually seem to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say in terms of maximizing your muscle, and not that a lot of women want to be, you're not going to be big and bulky all of a sudden. But if you you, you do want to maximize um, you know, your workouts to the best degree, it probably does um, seem in the literature that it's best to probably split your meals up into three to five meals a day and sort of get even protein distribution. Generally, is probably a better way to go. Um, in terms of maximizing your the workout benefit, right? Um, and then as part of that, getting in, um, you know, 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein uh, per kilogram of body weight, if you're trying to be active and work out, depending on your goals, somewhere in that range. So you multiply mm. your body weight in kilograms by 1.2 or 1.6. Um, and so that's sort of those, those two things, the nutrition portion. And then in terms of exercise, I think one of the key things people say, what's the best exercise to do to lose weight, to be in shape. So that the first tip on exercise for me is to find something that you enjoy, right? Like it's no point me giving you my workouts. Like I can show you things that I do, right? Like some days I swim, sometimes I sprint steps. Sometimes I do a high intensity interval training on like the ski machine and the, the rowing yeah. machine, the salt bike. Sometimes I just do weights. Sometimes I do jujitsu. Right. But you might not like any of those. Right. Like I didn't mention Muay Thai in there. Right. So I think the number one thing is, you know, find something that you enjoy mm -hmm. and, and try and do that and do it consistently and try to get, you know, some exercise in every day or at least five, six days a week. Um, the other thing is the next step is that I think if possible, you should include some um, resistance training in that. Right. Whether that's body weight, calisthenics or, or weights. I think just doing sort of like cardio and going for walks which i think is great right like a, a good paced walk or you know going for a jog i think that's great but i think it's important to do um you know some resistance training exercise and, and yeah. in doing that for a lot of people yeah you can split it up but let's say you're playing pickleball one day and going for a hike the next day and you're only fitting in one or two gym workouts or you know body weight workouts i think it's good generally for a lot of people to just do a full body um workout right and and trying to do those compound exercises so i don't know if you know the difference between compound and, and isolated but like a bicep curl or a tricep push down that's isolated but really focusing not on those maybe throwing those at the end of the workout but getting in um whole body uh, more compound stuff so squats for example mm. right push-ups or bench press pull-ups or some you know rows with a band attached to the wall yeah. or something like this. um 
so yeah, I think those are those are some of my tips. I don't know if that was four or five, but that was like four, I think. But yeah, I mean, uh, Pilates is a really good example of resistance training as well. I think mm-hmm. that something like Pilates is something that if someone doesn't like the gym, I feel like is a really good. I mean, I love Pilates personally, but yeah, I recently started getting back into the gym again. I was like loved the gym when I was in high school when I was doing Muay Thai. And I kind of just like faded away as I got into my career and I got busy and blah, blah, blah. And the last, I think, I don't know, five months, I've been going to the gym probably three, four times a week. And I think the biggest thing that I notice the difference is not necessarily like my physique, but more my mental health Oh, totally. from it and the change in my hormones as well for the ladies out there. It's so good for hormone regulation too. There's so many more, you know, I always talk about like weight being just a symptom of something else that's going on. And being able to kind of like help with that. And I think weight training is definitely a big, a, a big thing to kind of like focus on, especially if you're trying to like heal from certain things. I think that that mental health thing is that that's why I try to get the workout done when I can in the mornings. Yeah. One, by the time it gets to the late evening, I don't really feel like it. And it's a real <laughs> push to try and go if I haven't, if I haven't gone. And sometimes I will just skip it if I haven't done it earlier in the day. Yeah. Uh, so one is like going, getting it done out of the way in the morning for me, um, that really helps with just getting it done and making sure I fit it in because the day just gets away and gets busy. Right. Um, and then the second thing in, in the morning is I just feel mentally better for the day. I feel you know, ironically, like paradoxically that I have more energy when I've worked out in the morning, right. Which seems strange, but it's yeah. like I have more energy. Um, yeah. So doing it in the morning for me is, is twofold uh, benefit. One, I feel like I get it done and it's out of the way. So in the evening, I don't have to, worry about getting in when I'm feeling tired maybe and don't feel like going. So if I get it done in the morning and I'm, I'm more likely to just get that workout in and two, um, yeah, I just feel mental, mentally better for the rest of the day. So like from an anxiety perspective, less anxiety, more focused and just feel, you know, better mentally to go at the day basically. So I think there's more and more research coming out about that. It's not something I've really dug into on the mental health side, Yeah, um, but I think it's beneficial to get that workout in in the morning if it's possible. Plus you're productive. It's like, even if you don't do anything else for the rest of the day, like you already feel good about yourself. You're like, okay, I did this. I feel better, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I saw you recently talked to the Green Sports Alliance to talk about the impact of our food choices and what it has on like the environment and sustainability and how it's all kind of like correlated with the sports and fitness industry. So I'd love to hear about kind of what you talked about and kind of what, what that is even all about. Cause I haven't heard about it until I saw you posted about it. Yeah, well, first of all, the Green Sports Alliance is a large nonprofit, really about the greening of sports. Mm. Um, so every major league in the United States is a member, the NBA, the NFL, and so on. Um, and, you know, they're doing lots of things from like changing the light bulbs in stadiums to more energy saving light bulbs, collecting rainwater, composting. In 2017, I gave a talk at the Green Sports Alliance Food Symposium, and they quickly realized that the number one thing that anyone can do from, you know, their 200 uh, teams and 200 stadiums and the millions of fans that are represented by those uh, are members. Um, they quickly realized the number one thing that anyone can do to help with sustainability in the environment is shift towards more plant forward eating. Mm. So they're really making a shift towards incorporating that in their messaging. And it has been disappointing going to some of these other sustainability events where people are talking about recycling, you know, talking about plastic straws and the, the issues there. It, it, it's quite ironic that people are worried about plastic straws, but 86% of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, where all of this plastic is formed together, 86% of that is from discarded fishing gear, from mm-hmm. nets and lines and this type of thing. Like, If you want to stop plastic going into the oceans, you want to protect fish, just stop eating fish. It's, like, it's quite simple. Um, but I there's think just about this... that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, no, no. So it's, it's, um, it's strange. People are happy to like, you know, not use the plastic straws or you know, to recycle, but the number one thing they could do really is just, well, from the oceans is stop eating fish and, mm-hmm. and stop eating other animal products because all the runoff from all the nitrogen fertilizers that go into the streams and the oceans cause apoxic dead zones. I mean, you know, it's, I guess it's a little bit disconnected for people, but all these sustainability events that I've been to, there's a real lack of talk about food. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is great to see at the Green Sports Alliance, you know, that's what I'm talking about is the connection. Obviously, people want to know that if they are in sports that they can still get the right fuel that they need but they also are trying to make efforts to being more sustainable and so i'm talking at that intersection of sports you know sustainability and making sure you can get enough of the right nutrients 
on an eating more plant-based diet. So it is great to see entities like the Green Sports Alliance being a bit more progressive, recognizing it's not just about recycling and composting and that food yeah. plays a major role. Same thing just over a month ago, I spoke at the Change Now Summit on stage with um, the 2024 Olympics because they're talking about their sustainability goals and they're making a significant shift to more offering more plant-based meals at the 2024 Olympics. Oh, and, that's huge. Yeah, and so um, so I spoke on stage there at the Change Now Summit, which is the world's largest sustainability um, event, 35, 40,000 people in attendance. And so it is great to see, you know, in the last couple of years, there's starting to be this shift to this conversation about food and the role that it plays uh, in the environment and sustainability. So that's, that's really promising. That's awesome. Especially for the Olympics. I didn't even think about that. You know, when the Olympics comes into a city, there's so much that goes on. There's so much waste. There's so much trash. There's so much just consumption in general, I feel like. And I think that's something that, I mean, I didn't even really think about when it comes to Olympics. Millions of people, millions of meals, um, Mm -hmm spectating and 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 also the the athletes as well although that's a smaller percentage obviously of the footprint but it really seems like the 2024 olympics for the first time they're not as focused on just paying for carbon offsets which is the primary sort of focus that's been in previous summer olympics interesting Um, they're really trying to um you know use uh upcycled materials for the chairs um right which is the new sort of thing upcycling is a big thing now not just recycling um, so they're upcycling, they're using more sustainable building materials. Um, yeah, there's a lot, like even energy generation being attached to the grid rather than relying on uh, so many generators. Um, but they are making a big shift and recognize for the first time, really, the impact on food. And they're trying to make a lot higher percentage of their meals plant-based, like actually the majority of their meals now. So wow, it's a big shift from uh, the 2020 um uh, summer olympics so yeah that's exciting wow that's really cool and i think too like the more athletes that start to eat plant-based people really look up to athletes and really kind of like emulate their workouts on them or really you know aspire to be like them so i think the more people can like look up to someone who's eating a more plant-forward diet the more chance that we'll have of people doing that in their day-to-day life too yeah and i was asking um some of the representatives from like aramark and compass some of these large food service providers for all yeah. these and they said the biggest shift and the biggest sort of drive is coming from the athletes themselves, mm-hmm. particularly in the last three years or so, which is obviously coincides with the game changers coming out. But yeah. they're having a really big shift um, in uh, in athletes asking for more plant-based options available at the stadium. So that's exciting. Yeah, totally. I mean, so I've been a private chef for the last 12 years and I have been a chef for athletes. And, you know, I've had athletes like hire me to cook for them when they've come to town or come to LA or whatever. And I think the thing that I've noticed that it's where it's so hard for them to stay plant-based all the time is just because of traveling and just because of like the cities Mm -hmm. that they're going to, or just because of the availability. And that's definitely like a huge thing that deters them from, you know, continuing or staying on or off the wagon or whatever the term is. Although I've traveled, you know, I didn't travel much for a couple of years, obviously because of the pandemic, but I've been traveling a little bit more recently. And I am noticing a lot that there's more plant-based options like available yeah. at the airports. And, you know, there's usually a plant-based option or two on, on most of the restaurants when I'm traveling, uh, yeah. in the airports, for example. Well, yeah, it's so different. Like, you know, I was, I think my peak of my private chef career was probably like six, five, six years ago. And things are so different now than they were even five, six years ago. So I'm excited to see what happens in the next couple of years, especially now that the pandemic is like over for the most part. And yeah you know, things can kind of continue to progress again. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, no, me too. Okay. So I'm going to, I do this with every guest. I do a little speed round at the end. Um, okay. so basically yeah. just tell me what comes to mind and there's no wrong answers. You ready? Okay, cool. All right, cool. What's your morning routine? I have to know. Morning routine. Uh, I'll make a coffee and I put phytoprotein in it every <laughs> every day shameless now. plug <laughs> and then, well the funny thing is yeah but the funny thing is i didn't actually drink and this is supposed to be a quick answer round so apologies <laughs> but i didn't even used to drink coffee i'm from england so i drink tea like tw- black english breakfast tea twice a okay. day okay yeah but uh when this protein we realized it could go in coffee we did in-home user testing people were like oh i'm putting it in my coffee and it just disappears and i'm gonna do that with any other protein um so that's actually only a few months ago when i was like oh, okay let me try it in protein like okay now i actually like coffee 
Um, so that's why that's why I start drinking coffee just because of the phytoprotein. Actually, that's so that's yeah. Okay. I drink I drink coffee, um, and then you know sometimes obviously it's summer right now, but I might be dropping the kids off at school or something, um, and then I hit the gym uh, right away, um, get a workout in or run the steps or or something like that. Get a workout in, and then I just basically get back and um, and get to work. So that's uh, pretty much my. And then once I get back, I'll have a smoothie or you know, um, and that's that's my morning routine. I love it. It's nice and simple. I love that. Okay. Uh, what, what's your biggest passion outside your job? My biggest passion, uh, like personally, I would say is, um, doing jujitsu. Um, so I've retired from MMA from fighting, but I still train, especially in jujitsu. I love, um, you can't really think about anything else while you're in jujitsu, right? And it's like a physical game of chess. So, um, you can be sort of mentally focused and you're getting a great workout. And so, that's probably one of my you know, like my favorite hobbies. You know. I love that. What's your favorite restaurant? I prefer eating at home, honestly. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I just think it's it's quicker and easier often to just eat at home. So, um, okay. I don't really have a favorite. So, what's the, what do you eat for dinner? Like, what's your what's your go to meal? Uh, and it depends. Like, I'm not a very good cook, so I think uh, sometimes I just do. Uh, like a lentil pasta because that lentil is higher in, mm-hmm. in protein. I do a lentil pasta with some, you know, mixed frozen veg takes 10 minutes to, to steam. The, the pasta takes 10 minutes and then throw in some sort of sauce or maybe like do a tofu stir fry with veg and, um, you know, uh, some rice or I like sweet potatoes. Um, so yeah, pretty simple stuff. Um, definitely I'm not a chef, that's for sure. That's where I come in. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, who or what are you most inspired by right now? Hmm. It's a good one. Um, I'm, I'm inspired, um, and encouraged by uh, more and more people just making the shift towards more plant-based eating. So I don't think there's any one individual, but just the number of people that message me, especially when I get messages of people saying, you know, my husband was given a few months to live and mm. was, I thought they'd have a heart attack. And now, you know, since the film came out and I've watched it, so I, I get all these inspirational messages from people um, that sort of choke me up sometimes because I feel like, oh, we really did something and help people. So I get approached and messages all the time and those people are really inspiring um, and and honestly give me the drive to keep, uh, you know, to like do Game Changers too and, and all these other things. So I'm inspired by all those messages and all those people that are making the shift and seeing huge benefits, losing, t- you know, 100 pounds of weight or yeah. getting off medications or that's super inspiring for me. That's awesome. It's a reminder that like you're making a big impact and that's pretty powerful. Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Let's see if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? Well, I think it's obvious for me. <laughs> it's like the whole world would be, uh, would shift towards plant-based. That's yeah. I mean, I just think it's this, there's obviously so many things that need changing, right. Mm-hmm. Um, in the world. Um, but in terms of like what an individual can do themselves, going plant-based just seems to have so many benefits for public health, for the animals, for the environment, you know, for um, people in access to food in certain countries, from diseases. Mm-hmm. That would be the biggest thing for me is just see the world uh, go plant-based. I love that. It also increases like individual education as well. And I feel like a lot of people aren't education educated about food. And I think, you mm. know, going into that field kind of or going into that eating pattern can kind of help you just be more educated which could be like so impactful um, okay what advice would you give to your younger self mm. I heard Tom Hanks say this I think but it was uh this too shall pass so mm. you know when you have all these stressful moments and you have a lot of um anticipation about things that could go wrong like you know making the film like oh will people watch this like I felt it's on the one hand, you feel confident about it. And on the other hand, there's a lot of doubt. Um, and there's a lot of catastrophizing about what, you know, expectations about what might happen. And that leads to a lot of anxiety, unnecessary anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. Rather than just going through it. So those fe- those negative feelings that you have uh, about whether something will do well, whether you'll do well, you know, like walking into a cage for a fight, like a lot of that, those feelings are based on, um, your thought about the future of things that may and probably won't happen, right? So this too shall pass, this feeling of just, um, I'm feeling anxious right now is like, that's that's gonna pass. Even if I'm gonna have a fight at one point, that's gonna be gone 
you know, that's going to, that's going to be uh, in the past and don't, not, not worrying as much about things. I think that's one of the biggest things for me. I love that. I mean, you have the extreme example of cage fighting. So <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of nerves every time the weeks mm -hmm. leading up to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And even like going through your head, this could happen and that could happen and none of it ever happens. You know, most yeah. of the negative stuff that you, most of the negative consequences that people worry about usually don't happen. And, and a lot of times if they do happen, it's a, it's a, it's a result of that negative worrying. You yeah. Know? It's like self-fulfilling sometimes. Like, oh, I think this is, I'm not going to do well in this exam or whatever. It's like, well, usually you, you probably are going to do fairly well. And secondly, if you don't, it's probably because you had that mentality. Yeah, so, you've convinced yourself that you're not going to yeah. do well. So then yeah, how could yeah, you? Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. So what's a big personal goal that you have for yourself this year? <clears throat> I really want to compete again in, uh, in the, not in MMA, but in jujitsu. Cool. Uh, and so it's just getting enough. I'm so busy. It's just being able to get enough training in mm -hmm. um, where I feel ready to compete. So it's July. I'd like to do it within the next year. If I could do it this calendar year, that'd be great. Um, so. All right. I'll, I'll look out for that. I'm excited yeah. for you. I hope you get to yeah. do it. All right. Yeah. Well, do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience before I let you go? Um, I don't know if I'm one for much words of wisdom, but um, <laughs> no, I would just say, um, you know, Bruce Lee would say, research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless and add what is specifically your own. So I think, you know, there's so much, especially with nutrition or even with martial arts, like so many different topics there's so much information out there especially with social media flooding you um and so you've you got to sort of research you know you can't just take any one person's word for it whether it's a documentary like the game changers like don't just take you know what we said for it that the, the documentaries can inspire you right and give you some information but you want to sort of double check that and look into it yourself so look into that experience yourself you know absorb the things that you think are useful for you uh, and then and then make decisions based on that i think that's that's all i got that was pretty good. That was pretty good for someone that doesn't have a lot of wisdom. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Where can people find you? And like, where can people, you know, anticipate what you're going to do next? Yeah. I mean, uh, we're on social media, Game Changers Movie, right? Um, the Game Changers Institute has a website, gamechangersinstitute.com. Uh, my personal uh, Instagram is Lightning Wilkes. And then the Fighter brand has an Instagram, Fighter Fuel, F Y T A F U E L. And then obviously products are available for that if you're interested on uh, fighter.com. Cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Cool. Thanks so much for having me, Bailey. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much to James Wilkes for coming on the show. And I just want to make a huge shout out to this community for being here with me for the last four years for this podcast, for the last 90 episodes. I love y'all so, so, so much. And I can't wait for a new era, a new show, some new energy. And I'm just so grateful to all of you. Y'all, thank you so much. I will see you in September when the new podcast drops. And I hope you have an amazing summer and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.